Good to see you, Diana. Jane, another familiar face. Good to see you. Welcome, Giselle, Jacob. Victoria, Giselle. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hope you all were able to eat your dinners or hopefully you have it after or get some sort of nourishment in you. Um, yep, grab some food. Mm hmm. But nutrition and nourishment are just a few of the aspects and elements we're going to be touching on today with our uh, speaker. So we're just going to give it another minute or so and let people trickle in here. And welcome, Rachel. All righty, got Pamela. All righty, well, I'm gonna get us started here. It is 7.01. Um, welcome everybody to Social Justice Week 2021. We are officially on day two. Um, so my name is Joe Lofton and I will be your host for today's evening event. Some of you have had the pleasure of meeting me already. It's a pleasure to see those familiar faces and it's a pleasure to see those new faces today. Um, so just a little bit about me. I'm a current senior here at Sonoma State, graduating this spring. Uh, I'm a current uh, early childhood education major, and I'm working to become a teacher, and I'll be a resident teacher, kindergarten teacher at Aspire Richmond Tech uh, starting this summer. So going back home to my roots in the 510 and teaching my little kindergarten kiddos um, back in the community that I grew up in. So um, with that being, I'm going to introduce our facilitator today, who is Victoria Ortega. Um, Victoria, would you like to introduce yourself and tell everyone a little bit about you? Yeah. Um, hello, I'm Victoria. Um, uh, I am a senior at SSU as well, and I am an anthropology major. I will be helping out with like the tech stuff in the background. So if you have any questions, just message me in the chat. Yes, Victoria will be our woman behind the scenes and she will be taking care of us making sure this event runs nice and smooth so we are very lucky to have her here um so real quick i'm going to paste within our chat our ground rules for this evening um so this is pretty standard but i just want to read through this so everyone is on the same page uh if you've heard this just bear with me um and we'll just get through this so first uh please keep microphones muted unless asked to unmute by the host or facilitator uh, keep background distractions to a minimum, and if needed, please turn off your camera. Uh, be respectful and courteous to others. Speak from your own perspective, and we will not tolerate any derogatory nor hateful language or actions in any of our spaces. And I don't think we have to worry about that. We are here to cultivate our minds, to grow our brains, and to learn about issues, social justice issues, and how to understand them and to be able more effective agents of change within our world and society. Uh, so. With that being said, I would like to introduce our speaker, uh, Amy Kishis, Kichis, right? Yes. Um, so I just wanna read Amy's bio real quick, uh, just a little bit about her. So Amy received her bachelor's degree at Syracuse University, go orange, uh, majoring in women's and gender studies and sociology. Uh, throughout her college career, she has been known for her commitment to continuously bring awareness to the Latinx community in fighting against gender violence, sexual assault, gender and sexual inequality, queer discrimination, and racial issues. Amy also articulates theories and personal experiences into writing pieces that cover various topics, such as whiteness, radical self-love from brown girls, men mental disabilities in Latinx households, Latinx body issues, borderland, borderland identities, and radical queer love. Her work has been recognized by numerous platforms, such as the New York Times, Bustle, Bon Appetit, ID, Self Magazine, Mike, and Veg News. Through Instagram, Amy has the opportunity to continue sharing her knowledge through radical storytelling and creating workshops throughout the community. Lastly, Amy is the founder of Veggie Mijas, a woman of color collective that highlights the importance of veganism through the lens of those with marginalized identities. Through this collective, she has opened up new chapters in several states and cities and is organizing vegan folks of color in a national perspective. Amy also provides resources for folks in these cities on how their food can be more accessible and to learn more about the food system. So with that exemplar and extraordinary background and bio, I am pleased to introduce 
our speaker today, Ms. Amy. So pleasure to have you. Thank you so much, Joe. That was incredible. Y'all, I'm so excited to be here and um, share a bit of knowledge with y'all. Um, I'm gonna be talking about Vegemijas and the power of community activism for this social justice week. And if y'all have any questions, um, y'all can write them in the chat and Victoria will catch them and we can go over them at the end. But I'm really excited uh, for this presentation. As y'all know, my name is Amy because Joe introduced me so well. Um, but besides all of those fancy titles, um, I'm from Jackson Heights, Queens. I'm first generation, I'm Peruvian and Colombian. Um, and I have been plant-based or mostly plant-based for seven years now, since 2014. So, you know, just living that healthy life. Um, <laughs> it's, it's going great. Um, and yeah, that's a little bit about me. So with that being said, I'm just going to jump into my vegan journey. Um, so I went to Syracuse University and at Syracuse, I was studying women's and gender studies. And my friend was like, oh my gosh, you're such a big feminist. Like, I bet you would love veganism. And I was like, what is that? And she was, she's Dominican and she was like, you should read this book. And she gave me the book, Sista Vegan. And when I read about the Black experience with veganism, I thought it was so interesting because I never thought of food justice, like in that sense, from those personal experiences. But because I was still in school and didn't have like that much time to read other books, I wasn't, it didn't like hit me then. Um, until I watched Earthlings, which is a very like traumatic movie of like watching the animals suffer. And that hit me a bit harder. And I was like, mm, I think I'm going to stop. And I turned vegan immediately. Um, that was fresh, like end of freshman year, going into sophomore year. And I came back home and, you know, I just recently came out to my parents and I was turning vegan at the same time. My parents are like, what is college doing to you? Like you come back gay and vegan. <laughs> it was a whole thing. Um, so my parents thought, you know, it was just disrespectful to come into the house and, you know, say that I didn't want to eat certain things um, start moving things around the fridge. Uh, they just didn't get it. They thought that I wasn't getting enough protein um, and they didn't understand why I wanted to be vegan. And what that looked like was talking about their health and not only the health, but also, you know, how that it really does affect us um, and how we can do better be having a vegan lifestyle. So now they didn't support me then, but now my parents are actually mostly plant-based. Um, they do eat chicken here once in a while, but um, they, they, if you go into our household, um, you would see plant products everywhere. Like we don't have dairy in the house. It's just, it's really, really nice. Um, and they started doing their own research and they, they found out that it was actually more helpful, uh, for them and for their health. But I remember that before that, when I was just transitioning, it really occurred to me to start going through a very deconstructing type of veganism instead of the white veganism that I was learned. So as I explained, I went through, like I turned vegan because of the animals, right? So that led me to finding like white vegan spaces. And when I turned into those groups, it was very problematic and I didn't know it at that time and I knew and I know now after reflecting but I remember these white kids would go into cages and like be all bloody with like the fur like to prove a point or like white women would go to um like protest for PETA um and you know brag about being in jail like it was it was these um, ideas that they thought were so radical, but were actually very harmful, harmful to people of color and the way that we would view veganism instead of, you know, vice versa. Um, so because I entered through this phase, 
I was all about like the animals at first and I still am of course, but now I see veganism through such an intersectional lens that it's much less about the animals, but also much more about people of color and their right for food justice in general. So that's kind of how I started into uh, my vegan journey. And I think that's important because um, it's important to realize and reflect like how you get into these journeys, right? Like even when I turned into a feminist um, and claimed that I was a feminist, I got entered through white feminism, right? Because those are the books that like are mostly exposed. Um, so it's kind of, it was kind of the same thing with veganism. So when I turned vegan and I left out of college, I didn't have that much support of my vegan friends of color because they were like all white and problematic. Um, and I had my one friend that was Dominican, but that wasn't enough. And um, I wanted to just create Veggie Mijas just to have friends. Like that was the purpose of creating it. So we, I created an Instagram and y'all know how terrible we eat at college. Like it'll be like ramen for a day and then like the next day who knows you go to an event and get free food like that's how it was right for me um so we I started it like to to just kind of share recipes with college students and that wasn't enough for me I wanted to create I wanted a platform where people can share all of their recipes um so it started as just the platform to have friends and then it came into something more so talking about veggie mijas so what, what is Veggie Mijas? Veggie Mijas is a woman of color and non-binary folks of color collective where we highlight the importance of our identities and having a plant-based lifestyle. Um, we're very passionate about spreading awareness um, such as healthier options in the hood, animal liberation, environmental justice, food justice, sharing family recipes, sharing our own recipes and how like we turn it into being vegan recipes. Um, and talking about why plant-based foods are so connected with our ancestral roots. Um, the way that we do that is that our mission is to create then spaces, sacred spaces for folks of color where they can share their experiences with food, whether that's eating disorders, whether that is like a connection of like their family or a non-existent connection of food and their family, um, all of those kinds of conversations and having now having a plant-based style and how that affects uh, with their personal identities. So our main focus is just sharing the space, learning ancestral practices through food and providing access to information that the information that our community needs. So as I said, that summer, I just created that page. And the way that that happened was that I just created an Instagram page. And then I was like, no, this isn't working. Like, let me just make a call out, right? For a collective, for everybody to submit recipes. So when I started that, I actually created a Google spreadsheet because people were like, oh, I'm from San Francisco. I'm from Oakland. I'm from this and that. Can I submit a recipe? And I was like, of course you can. Like, it's just going to be viral. But I ended up collecting that information anyway, and I didn't know what I was doing with that information. I just started collecting it. And I collected their identity, where they were from, their pronouns, their emails, all of their information. Um, and the reason why I did that was because I just didn't, I didn't know. Like I, for me, I thought it was like, what if I go to that city and I wanna meet up with people? Like that's how I was thinking. Um, and the reason why I started to become like, it became kind of a collective was because I started getting way more passionate about food justice in general. I remember when I went to uh, Jackson, it's like where I'm from, and I went to a food truck, um, a, a vegetable truck, and the guy was like uh, selling us vegetables and fruits. And then we got home and we realized that the fruits actually have gone bad. And I told my dad, I was like, oh, no, we have to get our, we have to go back and get our money back. Like, what do you mean? And we went back and he was like, oh, I'm sorry. And he went back to the food truck, opened it up and gave us fresh fruits and vegetables. And I was like, why did you do that? Like, why did you sell us bad fruits like in, on purpose? And he said, well, I was trying to get rid of them for money and, you know, like, that's just, you know, that's just how it is. And I was like, okay, whatever. 
And because of that, like, I can't blame him, right? Like he's trying to get money out here. Like it's not him. It's not his fault. I mean, yeah, he, he shouldn't be selling me those fruits, but like the problem is much bigger, right? Um, and I think that's why I got so passionate about it because I was like, this isn't his fault. Like this is a whole system. This is about food apartheid that's happening in our communities and we're not, and it's not being talked about as much. Um, so that's why I kind of started just collecting this information to see like if anybody else had that experience. So in March um, of 2018, um, a lot of people were actually like, hey, like there's a bunch of us on this list. Like, why don't we just meet up? And I was like, you know, that's a great idea. I don't know where to meet up. And then people were just like, oh, like it could be at my house. Like I'll bring food, like whatever. It became into a whole potluck. And when I came to the Bronx and I opened the door and I saw 40 people, I was like, is this, is this my event? Like, what is going on? Like, I just didn't, I just had no idea. Um, and once people saw those photos of everybody getting together in the Bronx, um, everybody wanted to open their own chapters as well. And the first chapter became Oakland where they had their own events as well. And it just started as potlucks and then it became much more. So now we have a whole team. We have a leadership team, an education team, a creative team, and a bunch of organizers that are just continuing to do so much creative work on food justice and environmental justice. So some of the events that we've had, um, we've had a bunch of like potlucks, as we said, but then it started being into beach, beach cleanups, farm sanctuary trips, um, sip and swap for fashion, sustainable fashion events, uh, queer healing events, uh, celebrating lunar, lunar year, um, essential oils, like yoga, meditation, um, and just like a bunch of gardening events. Um, and it just started kind of exploding of how many how much work we can do in the community right not just getting together but for the community such as having gardening events um fashion events and just like a bunch of events where other people that are not veggie me has members can also come into and join us so i actually love like sharing this one story uh we went to a community garden in the bronx and we were cleaning it up and once we were cleaning it up there was like 15, 10 of us there. And, you know, a lot of people started lurking, like, oh, what are they doing? Right. Um, and some guy, he came over, he was like, yo, I've lived here for like five, like forever. And I never knew there was a garden here because it was always, um, it, it like they, it, they never fixed it. So we were like one of the first people to come in and fix it and actually garden things. And he was so happy. He was like, back in my country, I used to plant uh, peppers. Is, is it a possibility that I can come here and like start doing that? And I was like, of course, like go contact the guy. And, you know, they started talking and whatever. And I'm assuming like he's out there planting peppers, like in a garden that he didn't even know that was five minutes away from him. So, you know, and then like other people coming from from um, shopping and like taking their little girls, like getting mints and basil and like being like, oh, we're gonna put this basil in the spaghetti. Like it was such an interactive way of getting the community involved um, to things that they didn't even know they had access to. Um, so that was really, really incredible. There's other events that we do as well in Veggie Mijas where we go to uh, high schools or middle schools to do presentations and to do recipes and to cook, to cook simple stuff for them that they've already done that they don't realize it's vegan, right? Because a lot of times people like think about veganism and think it's like this whole complicated whole nine yards, like you have to go to Whole Foods to buy vegan food. Like sometimes it's literally already food that they eat and getting kids to know that is so, so important. So we teach a lot of kids in Veggie Mijas and go to different workshops. Um, and we also now uh, have community garden plots in Austin, Philadelphia, and we're having one in LA. And um, currently, right now, we do have a uh, Los Angeles community uh, fridge, and we have two. And our organizers stack the fridge up every two weeks with a bunch of food. And weekly, they have um, 
a brown like a social like hour whatever where they stand outside and they give food to other people in veggie me has tote bags with pamphlets on rest on simple recipes on how to um you know create dishes with the food that they're giving we have food drives and we have like just a bunch of things that again like talk to the community um the community work that they're doing so as of right now we have 12 active active chapters. We're in New York City, LA, Dallas, Philly, Chicago, New Orleans, Austin, Orlando, Denver, Oakland, Seattle. And we just went, gave the announcement that we're currently in India. So we have an international chapter now. And that's super exciting for us. Um, and we're just so excited to know, to see all of the work that she's doing. She's in B Mumbai, but she's planning on traveling all over India to give workshops uh, to various communities um, and in co collaborations with other members that are doing the same work as Veggie has. So that's really exciting. Um, and in, and on the left side, you can see some of the ones that are in process um, to being active and finding organizers in those chapters. So as of right now, uh, Veggie Mijas does a lot of work outside, but we also do a lot of um, internal social media work. And one of the things that we focus on um, is uplifting people of color businesses. So we do interviews with people that have vegan businesses um, and uplift them through our website. And in our website, you can also find recipes that is actually called cocinando con, like cooking with, and then the person's name. And the reason why that name came to be was because my mom, She's Colombian and she actually didn't grow up knowing how to cook and she actually learned how to cook through YouTube and one of the girls that teaches her how to cook her name is Wendy and it's called Cocinando con Wendy. So I kind of took that name in Cocinando con in to give kind of like an honor of my mom for you know teaching me how to cook. Um, well, not teaching me how to cook but like trying to learn how to cook in order to end that cycle of women not knowing how to cook in my family. Um, and in, through our website, like I said, like we have recipes, we do people of business of color highlights, we have resources, like a bunch of uh, books that you can read and articles, um, how to get food stamps, um, apps that tell you the nearest food pantries, uh, people that you, you can follow, like it's, a whole thing and we try to be as inclusive as possible with you know not just going out in the streets but also people that have media access as well lastly one of our last projects that we worked on was a casa verde cookbook and this cookbook has more than um 10 different like countries of recipes and we're currently sold out but we sold out like five times already um in a very like in very short times um, and this book has also been like uh, featured in farm sanctu sanctuaries where they have been uh, sold and sold also internationally. And this is something that we put together as a collective to just raise donations um, for, for our collective. So that was a really cool project. And we're currently working on volume two to get published for our book. So this is just a short list of people that, you know, we think y'all should follow on Instagram. These are incredible people that are doing, you know, similar and also not similar work um, that I think is very important to highlight. So Isanet, uh, founder of Woke Foods, uh, Vegan Voices of Color, they highlight a lot of people of color that are vegan and they tell their story, which is like really empower, empowering if you're trying to, to go vegan and you need to, you know, see more of us and see more of our stories. Um, Genesis Butler, who is a young, incredible activist, um, she actually got featured to be like a Marvel superhero. And if y'all have Netflix, y'all should check it out because it's super cute. Um, and I think it's also important to listen to youth and see, you know, like they just be knowing like little kids be seeing chicken on their plate and they're like, how did that get there? Like, I don't want to eat this. Like they just be knowing. Um, and Foxy Vegan, she has amazing recipes. Uh, Nalguna Positivity Pride, who focuses on um, who centers around fat, uh, fat positivity. And I think that's very important for the vegan movement. Um, 
and just other incredible people like Amber Tam, who is a farmer. And, um, you know, we need to definitely highlight farmers in, in our work, um, in our vegan work as well. So that is it for my presentation. Um, Y'all can follow us on Veggie Mijas on the Instagram. We have a LinkedIn, we have Facebook, we have YouTube, we have Twitter, um, and we have our website, Veggie Mijas. And that is all for me. Awesome, that was well beautifully spoken, Amy. Uh, could we just give Amy just a quick round of applause virtually or you know, however you wanna do that just for going through with that with us. Um, you spoke a lot of things that I want to touch on, but first, I also want to be able to address the questions that uh, some of our students have um, and some of our audience members have. So uh, with that being said, if you do have any questions that, you know, came up that you wrote down or, you know, were inspired to um, kind of ask, um, this is the time to do so. Please go ahead and message either Victoria or I, and we can get those questions on and get those questions going in our uh, discussion. But um, Amy, for our first question comes from Pamela. And she asked, what are some things that you think Sonoma State students can do in our own community to help and actions that we can take for food, for food justice? That's a great question. I would say the first step is seeing if anyone is already doing the work because you're not trying to reinvent the wheel or you're not trying to like do something that's something like someone's already doing, you're always going to want to give credit to folks. So number one, doing that, seeing if there is and if there is getting involved um, and if there isn't definitely reaching out to community gardens, um, you know, going to farmers markets, seeing if there's some some type of way you can get involved with any workshops, if people are doing anything to um, let people know how to how to cook with the things that they're produced that they're buying. Um, finding ways that you can definitely get involved with your community and seeing who's doing the work. Awesome, thank you. And then, um, so uh, Diana also has a question. She was wondering if you can talk more about the link between environmental justice and food justice. Um, and just yeah. touching off a little bit about that. That's, a, that's also a really great question. Um, so with environmental justice, I don't know if y'all seen what the health, but that's like the first thing that comes to mind with to me is um, honestly just like where farm factories are located and in, they're mostly located around where black and brown people are living and all of the feces and all of those toxins are going literally through their house and they cannot uh, breathe properly. They have a lot of asthma problems. Like they have a lot of health problems because of that. And like, that is the one thing that I think of when linking environmental justice and food justice. And even like what takes for those farm factories to be, right? Like you have to destroy a bunch of land, bunch of trees, a bunch of animals, and a bunch of other people that live there as well. And these people, black and brown people, literally get pushed all the way to where these farm factories are being created because nobody wants to live around there. So I think that's like the first thing that I think about. And, you know, food justice, honestly, it I tell this to everybody. I'm like, it connects to every issue, right? Like my friend wasn't wasn't wrong. Like if you're a feminist, like food justice is there. Um, and I think about who's working in these farm factories. It's mostly immigrant folks, uh, black and brown folks. And when you're having all of this trauma of killing these animals, like we're not robots, you know, like that's gonna affect us. And there's a lot of research out there on how it affects these workers. Um, and how they can bring this domestic violence home because they're doing this violence every day and that affects women. So, you know, women's rights is food justice in that sense. Um, and for farm workers and just everything, everything is just very, very connected. And uh, another question coming in uh, from Pamela. Uh, so she asks, how are the chapters started and is there one in San Francisco? Yeah, so there is not one in San Francisco. There is 
one in process. So there's probably like one or two people that are currently in the process of starting one. Um, and if you're interested in, in having a chapter or joining in, um, you can email recruitment at vegemijas.org and there is a short process to be a organizer at Vegemijas. Awesome. Um, thank you, Amy. And then if I may, just touching on um, a part of the talk that really resonated with me was you recognizing that cycle of, you know, family members not always being able to cook, right? And that, um, you know, there's a lot of hurdles that, you know, parents have to go through in terms of managing kids and like working jobs. You know, my parents specifically, we weren't always the family to like cook meals every day. We ate out more than we ate in. And that's due largely to the fact that we had to commute five days a week from Richmond to San Francisco, uh, which is probably like a hour, hour and a half commute with no traffic. Um, but in terms of that, in that you recognizing that cycle, um, how did you notice that? And, you know, and what were those steps that you take that you took to change that cycle and kind of altering that narrative and saying that I'm going to be able to cook, you know, I'm going to be able to be able to cook and put food on my table, high quality food that I'm proud of. So. Could you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, so that's that's very interesting, Joe, because I do want to disclaim that I don't cook like that. And I think I'm going to definitely talk about that in a moment. Um, so I so I actually recently asked my mom, well, I, I recently asked my sister because my sister was the one that lived with my grandma a lot growing up because my mom came here and she migrated to the U.S., so my sister, she grew up with my grandma at a very like old age, and she actually came with a lot of like traumas around food because my grandma, she only sustained herself and like at most times she really couldn't. And my sister ended up eating a lot of food that went bad um, and had like or like odd tastes. Um, so when she came to the U.S., uh, she actually realized that my mom didn't know how to cook either. And she had a really hard time um, with food and would go and my parents would go to um, like fast foods, uh, you know, uh, food because like they were out and they were working all day. And there was just a disconnection with food because they were just trying to survive. Um, then they had me, which is then when my mom started to learn how to to learn how to cook um, like I said, with on YouTube and she really tried, but because, you know, it was a process, I didn't grow up, um, having that experience that a lot of people have where their moms are like, come to the kitchen and like, learn how to do this or like, learn how to like do this, uh, recipe from like your grandma. Like I didn't grow up like that. I actually grew up quite the opposite. Like I would come into the kitchen and be like, Oh mom, like, what are you making? And she'd be like, I don't know if it came out that well, like, don't try this or like, don't do this. And, you know, it was very like, it was very isolating for her in the way that she learned how to cook. And that's why I didn't grow up that way. And when I became vegan, it actually re-inspired her to get really creative. And this is like the first time to, that she has actually learned and has staple dishes that are vegan because it allowed her to go beyond of what is the norm, right? Just like having me and like rice at the table. Like she's gotten so creative and has like vegan fish with like mango sauce or whatever. Like, I don't know, just like crazy dishes that you would have never thought. Um, but because I didn't have that experience growing up, I didn't learn how to cook. And now I feel like being first gen um, first generation, I grew up having a lot of guilt, not knowing how to cook because of these cycles. But, you know, I just came into realization that that's okay. Like I'm breaking the cycle of that by talking about food justice and by talking about why food is so important. And then hopefully like my, my partner is actually like an amazing, like chef, like she cooks all the time. So I know that my kids are going to grow up with that experience and they're also going to grow up knowing what happens in my family and why like that needs to stop and like hopefully they'll end that cycle you know but breaking cycles doesn't have to happen with you um and I think that's something that first generation kids have to like get that in their heads because you know like for a long time I was too afraid to say like I didn't learn I didn't I don't know how to cook 
but that's okay. You know, having a, a whole food justice organization and not knowing how to cook. I mean, that's, that's the whole reason why I started this, you know, and that's the whole reason why this needs to exist because I'm not the only one that has this issue, especially with kids that come from migrated parents. Beautiful, well-spoken, and getting thumbs up from Diana down there. Um, so that's beautiful. Um, Y'all keep the questions coming in. Um, this is, we're facilitating a great discussion here. Um, but just to kind of build off of like what we already talked about, um, in terms of, you know, our students and the rest of our audience. Um, so Amy, how would you go about encouraging, you know, students and the rest of your audience to maintain a healthy and balanced lifestyle, especially on this more virtual dominant world that we're we've been accustomed to it hopefully it's reshifting and changing uh direction to the state of like we're getting back into classes and back into our office and work and whatnot um but what are some of those tips and advice you can give to you know our audience to that helped you uh, throughout covid and you know to help you you kind of maintain that healthy balance to a perfect lifestyle Whew, that's a hard one. I mean, honestly, if you're breaking down, that's okay. Like get back up the next day. You know, I'm not here to be like some like woke spoken person. Um, I think honestly, like setting up reminders of like, please eat, please hydrate, like, please do like, you know, just little reminders like that can go a lot, a lot of, you know, a long way. Um, I would also say like plan your self care and not like, self-care but like actual self-care whatever that look that looks like to you uh plan at least an hour or half an hour a day because that's the fuel that gives you and sometimes like that's something that honestly I'm working at um while I'm working on I go to therapy bi-weekly and a thing that I have is that I I don't see my mental health as a priority um because I just have so much work to do currently I'm in grad school I work at Planned Parenthood I do veggie mijas um I yeah it's just a lot so I was telling my therapist that I don't view mental health as a priority and she said you have to view your mental health as an investment because this is what's going to give you that fuel to continue doing all the work that you have to do and if you and if that's the way that you think about things, you have to view it as an investment for yourself. And I feel like that kind of mentality shifted everything for me. I like you, you know, I set a reminder, like turn off your turn off your computer at five o'clock. Like you're not working anymore. They don't pay you that well. Like <laughs> stop working, you know. Um, so just setting reminders like that and just giving yourself that pep talk goes a long way. Beautiful. And yeah, maintaining that balance and that, right, that also we're working on our physical health, our nutrition, our physical fitness, but you know, we can't forget that mental aspect, right? It's a, it's a balance between all things. And that's what we kind of have to emphasize, right? Um, but kind of touching off, you know, some of the other questions that our panelists were or our audience members were talking about, um, in terms of environmental justice, I was wondering, Amy, if you can touch on a little bit more about climate justice, and you know, why is this an urgent, uh, matter for black and brown communities specifically? Yeah, that is hella, hella important. Um, you know, I think it's so, I think climate justice honestly needs more of like political framework because that's what's really stopping us. I think all of us that are on the ground have been knowing about climate justice and have been affecting, like been affected by climate justice. I mean, climate change, my bad, but the ones that are not affected by climate change, they think it's gonna come to them like way later, you know? Um, and it's wild. So I think that climate change really, like it really has to be amplified doing um, political work. And that's lobbying and talking to politicians, petitions, putting up information about climate change, um, just doing the whole nine yards to get that attention. Because I feel like, those are the people that need to know what's going on because black and brown people have been knowing about climate change and have been affected by it. And it also sounds like, you know, a lot of the work that, you know, Veggie Mijas does is kind of giving those um, groups of people who have often been neglected and neglected and marginalized, giving them a platform to actually, you know, 
voice their concerns and to be able to come into a group into um, a, like what was the name of it? Uh, call it what was the name you called it again? A co not a coalition, but a collective. Collective, collective yeah. Mm -hmm you know, having that sense of belongingness and inclusiveness, right? That is something, you know, we all strive for. And, you know, I'm glad that you were able to find that, especially within your college experience, um, you know, and that's something, you know, I struggled with, you know, be, being a teacher, uh, aspiring educator of color, let alone a male of color, um, aspiring to be a teacher. So that was something I grappled with. Um, so Amy, in terms of that, what kind of advice can you give to you know, not just our students, but, you know, our, you know, adult, our adult audience members as well in terms of, you know, um, how to find that sense of belonging and like what that process kind of, you know, looks like, because it's not, you know, it's not a linear path, right? It's not a straight way path because, you know, you didn't just find veggie mijas, right? It kind of, there were some trials and errors and you found some groups that worked out, found some groups that didn't, but, you know, I was wondering if you could just speak more to that experience and kind of hopes of, um, giving our students and the rest of our audience members a little bit of hope of finding their sense of belongingness, you know, no matter yeah. where they go in life. Mm -hmm. That is hella important. And something that I always think about is like, if you don't see a space that has been created for you, then make it. Um, I think that's like the number one thing, because that's what happened with Vegemias. I didn't see vegans of color talking about things. Um, I know that there's organizations that exist like food empowerment project is incredible y'all like they're the ogs of veganism and talking about the intersectionalities of it like shout out to food empowerment project but in terms of like a collective and doing work together that hasn't been done and so i created it without even knowing right i identify as um queer and christian and those two, like, you're not going to find it so hard to find spaces that talk about both and, um, you know, like, believe in your faith uh, while you're queer. Um, so I created a small group with my for my church. That's that we talk about being queer and relentless. Um, so just like finding, you know, if you don't find the space for it, then create it. If you are passionate about so many different things, then there has to be a way to mush them together. Um, I don't think that that um, any social justice um, work stream is separate than others, right? Just like we talked about. So I think finding what you're passionate about and finding the space and if not creating the space is the best advice. Beautiful. Yeah. And, you know, I worked what you already said, I worked that into action too. just um, just to give a sense of understanding. Like I'm like I said, I'm an undergraduate man of color looking to be a teacher. And, you know, that's something that that's not the norm, you know, and at Sonoma State, that's something that's evident. Our school of education program is predominantly white and female. And, you know, walking to class, I felt like, you know, I didn't belong, you know, that the norm was white. And the fact that I was the outlier that I didn't belong, you know, so I appreciate you kind of touching on that in that process of you finding that group and really right. making it, taking it into your own hands, if you will. Yeah. And making that I feel like own. that's so important, right? Like what you're doing is so important. And I think like you could even, you could even like put out information as to why that is right. And what are the effects of just having white women as professors and, or teachers versus like a person of color in a classroom full of people of color, right? Like how many, like, I feel like as I went up in my degree, I saw less people of color in taking those spaces. And that's so important to talk about. So exactly. not in my case with women's and gender studies though. Syracuse is <laughs> the best program though, <laughs> but <I agree. laughs> for sociology and other things, yeah. <laughs> Michelle, we bet. Um, and then I see Diana, you have a question and your hand raised for a question comment. Yeah, please feel free to. I, I just wanted to say this, this was going to be easier to just say rather than type in that as someone who's um, next birthday will be a big one and it won't be 50. Let's put it that way. Actually, two birthdays away from it. But I am so glad to see this coming generation and my son is 16 so you know he's closer to your generation obviously than his mother and father but that you are finding who you are because I think for example I have a friend whose son 
uh, just graduated with his nursing degree. And I have another friend whose daughter wants to be a computer scientist. And, and I'm just so thrilled that you're not so bound by the goddamn SOB and I won't put it, you know, gender stereotypes. So then of course there's all the, the, the other stereotypes that come in and, and um, so I say my husband is a person of color and my son identifies as non-white. So, you know, we're figuring that all out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it's so funny we get together with friends sometimes at Thanksgiving we didn't this year for obvious reasons but and it's like we realize well, we've got a Buddhist we've got a Muslim we've got a lapsed Mormon we've got an atheist and agnostic and someone who's Jewish but secular so, so we all enjoy Thanksgiving Aww. so it's just you know to, to really I, I applaud I applaud for for finding your own space and if you don't find it create it I think that's really powerful and that's something that uh, that I am glad to hear. Thank I'll you. shut up now. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Diana. You. Appreciate you bringing that into the space. Um, yeah, and so in terms, you know, I feel, you know, this is something that, you know, we're not just here to, you know, learn and educate ourselves, but we're also here, you know, social justice is, you know, action, you know, it's, you know, action, it's poetry in motion, you know, it's, you know, it's walking the walk and talking the talk. So um, in terms of, you know, if anyone here wanted to get involved with Veggie Mijas, Amy, um, how can we do that? And what's the most, um, you know, vital way we can support, you know, your mission and what you all are trying to accomplish? Yeah, thank you, Joe. Um, first would be following us on Instagram at Veggie Mijas. Um, if you could click on our link, um, you can, go directly to the interest form if you're interested in joining an active chapter. If there is not an active chapter, when there is one, you will get notifications to events and updates of that chapter. If you want to start an own chapter um, or join any team, you can hit up recruitment at vegemihas.org. And lastly, if you're not gonna join and you're just gonna support us, you can also support us financially. And that information is on our Instagram and our website. And if you cannot support us financially, and if let's say you have connections to any restaurants, any brands, any people that want to cook meals for the community fridge that's near you, you can definitely do that. And you can email veggiemijas at gmail.com. Awesome, beautiful. And I also included the Veggie Mijas website link into the chat. Um, but I just really want to give these last couple few minutes if anyone has any last minute uh, comments, questions they'd like to uh, make, this is the time to do so. You know, we are not here for a long time. So let's do our best to take advantage of the time that we have together. Um, and also, I will be copy, copying and pasting a survey link. Um, based on today's event. Um, so I highly encourage you all to please, 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 to please do this and fill it out for us. Um, this is how we're able to get Social Justice Week at Sonoma State. And this is something that's become a staple and household within our community. So let's continue to keep that ball rolling and you know, giving us your feedback and giving us you know, your perspective on these events will only make it better in the future, right? So take that few minutes three to five minutes out of your day just to do that for us. And we would greatly appreciate it. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions, um, but Amy, is there any last, you know, comments, advice, suggestions that you'd like to give to our audience today while we're still here together? Yeah, I think my last thing would be um, before starting anything, start with yourself. Um, and if you want to, go vegan to do that work. Um, and you can always talk to anyone that's in the collective for any journey that you're trying to do. Um, and really just start the deconstruction with, with yourself and question a bunch of things like question where your food comes from, question how your family ate uh, before they came to this country, if that's your experience. Um, try any plant-based foods that maybe they tried and they didn't share with you. Um, there's also a lot of misconception around veganism and how veganism, um, shortens your, uh, ability to eat like different things, but I think it's actually the opposite. Um, I think it expands you to different vegetables, 
different fruits, different recipes that you can make. And it's a lot of creativity. So don't be um, discouraged. Um, and there's also, you know, the myth that veganism is expensive. And while, yes, it can be expensive if you're buying fake cheese, fake, fake meat all the time. Um, but if you really think about it, meat is also expensive and milk is also expensive. Um, and you can find different ways of um, creating other plant-based foods that don't involve fake dairy and fake meat, but actually plants. Um, and yeah. Beautiful. Let's can we give Amy one more round of applause if possible. And just thank you. We know you're on that East Coast time too. So it's a little bit <laughs> of a time yeah. zone difference. So again, we appreciate you coming out. Um, thank you again, Victoria, for making sure our chat runs smoothly. And then thank you to the rest of our audience members, Diana, Giselle, Pamela, Jane, Jacob, Catherine, thank you all for coming in. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evenings and take care, y'all. And keep thank the justice going. Bye. Alrighty, take care.